In this video, I'm going to talk with you about something that's just been revealed to me. And it was revealed to me in not the greatest way, to be honest. I, I Something is going on. God is doing something new because I've had a lot of people very intensely coming at me in the last, I don't know, probably week or so. I mean, very intensely, like Satan is upset about the things that I'm saying. And, you know, honestly... I have learned to truly rejoice in that because one of the things that God shows me is that I'm on the right track. If Satan's coming at it, I mean, he doesn't mess with his own kingdom in this way anyway. I mean, he does create division in his own kingdom, but he doesn't target you like the way, like what he's doing with me. So I had a really nasty, nasty person come on the channel, but I was introduced to something. <laughs> he had total distortions of doctrine. And it's funny because I just got done posting a video earlier today about the schemes of the devil and things to watch out for. And then no sooner did I post that video, did I start getting messages from this very nasty per or this person who had a very nasty spirit in them. Let's put it that way. Cause I'm still going to pray for this person and I'm supposed to, you know, want for them to be brought into repentance and to know truth. This person had a lot of distortion of doctrine and I could feel myself getting discombobulated and confused. And when you feel yourself, when you feel that happening, you need to step back and you need to recognize what's going on. And so I did tell him that he was bringing up some good points. There was something that he introduced me to and I couldn't reconcile it with, the, with what I knew already. But, you know, of course, just my mere mention of that, my mere acknowledgement of that, threw him into arrogance. Yeah, I thought you'd like that. I mean, it's like, you know, from one person of God to another person of God, all we're doing is having a conversation. If we both love truth and we both love God, it's really not about us. And I was perfectly willing and have still been willing to sit back, to pray, take my time, be prudent. And I'm not, and I, you know, one of the things I said to him is I'm not concerned about being right. I'm concerned about God's truth, especially because I'm in a position where I'm sharing with you. I want to make sure I'm right. So I'm always testing and challenging. And you know, that's kind of a hard process because sometimes when you can't reconcile what someone is presenting to you and you see that it is in the word, but you, you ha God hasn't quite put the piece together yet, it can be really scary. And you can go down this path, which I did tonight of, Lord, if I'm not speaking truth, if I'm not serving you, I have nothing. I have nothing. There's nothing I would want to go back to, but there is nothing to go back to. You see what I'm saying? So, I mean, even if I wanted to, which I don't, I don't want anything but God. So that can be really challenging, but you know what? I stand for truth. That's it for his truth. Well, I really did not. It's about 1130 right now. And I did not, I could not go to bed without at least being able to sort through a piece of this. And in his mercy, he put the picture together for me pretty quickly. All it took was a shower to calm me down <laughs> and just talking with him. Then I went back to the scriptures. I looked up what the man was saying. It didn't change any of the doctrine that I've been talking about. It just added something. Uh, you know, not added something to the scroll, but it added something that I didn't know that I had not realized. So I want to share it with you. But I also wanted to share that process because, you know, if you're serving him, there's always going to be something you're learning. He's likely going to put you in positions like he put me in tonight where he's testing my heart and mind to make sure that I can be given a trust. And ah, I just realized, okay, he always does that when he's deepening what he has me doing. So I tell you this all the time. You have to prove worthy to be given a trust. And then once you've proven worthy with that trust, you will, you need to prove worthy for the next trust. So I think that's what he's doing with me. And that's pretty awesome because I've been praying for some things, not things, but I've been praying for gifts and I've been praying to be brought in deeper to the kingdom of heaven. So this is pretty amazing. Now let me show you what was, uh, what was shown to me tonight. It all started with this scripture, but this person was creating a whole doctrine around it. So um, it, the other things that he was talking about were really wonky and just not consistent with what God's taught me. I mean, certainly I was willing to test it to make sure that what God, what that I have heard from God and what I have understood is correct. But when he started making these arrogant comments, I kind of called him out and I said, you know, the, your, the way that you write 
it's kind of difficult to tell if you're like being arrogant or sarcastic. I'd appreciate it if you let me know because I'd like to know what spirit I'm dealing with. And no sooner did I post that, did I then get a message about how Jerusalem, oh, you, I, I hope you don't think that the bride is us. It's, it's Jerusalem, the mother. That's our mother in heaven. I know that doctrine. That doctrine was taught in Mormonism when I was growing up. We don't have a mother in heaven. We have a father in heaven. That's a very carnal perception. In Revelation 12, Zion is seen as the mother who births the church, but it's not like a literal mother. That's a carnal perception of, you know, that like God is flesh and he needs a natural woman to be his wife. I mean, that's, that's ridiculous. We know that Jerusalem is the bride of Christ because Revelation tells us that. Jerusalem is seen coming out of the sky as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. So I want to tell you that process because I want to help you understand. I mean, that was what I was doing with God as I'm reading through these comments because sometimes it's difficult to tell, um, you know, especially when you're when you're writing messages and you're not hearing the tone, you're not seeing their face. If a person is just being evil, if they're acting out this evil that's inside of them, but God will make it clear. He will make that ugly head rear so that you can see very clearly what you're dealing with. And up until that point, what I was feeling is that the enemy was trying to exhaust me and confuse me and cast out. So it's really important for us to step away and pray. And that was exactly what I had told him that I was going to do. I said, you, you've brought up some good points, but you know, I need to be prudent and I need for God to reveal these things to me. So I'm going to step away. I have a busy day tomorrow. I may not get back to you right away, but I will. And that was that. Then I started getting those crazy messages. <laughs> so cool. That's my process. Now let's take a look at what was revealed to me. So I'm going to look in Job verse, uh, excuse me, chapter 14. And I'm going to start at verse 10. But a man dies and is laid low. His, he breathes his last and is no more. As the water of a lake dries up or a riverbed becomes parched and dry, so he lies down and does not rise. Now here's the part. Listen. Till the heavens are no more, people will not wake or be roused from their sleep. Is that amazing or what? I mean, Job said it thousands of years before it even happens. This is something that he knew. Now listen to verse 13. If only you would hide me in the grave and conceal me till your anger has passed. If only you would set a time and then remember me. So this is a reference. I mean, it's not just a reference to what Job is going through at that time. This is a reference to God's great wrath. All right. So that's all we really need from this passage of scripture is to know that the heavens are no more. Until the heavens are no more, people will not awake or be roused from their sleep. So the resurrection will not take place until the heavens are no more. Now let's go to Revelation 6. We're going to go to Revelation 6, verse 12. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. Actually, let's start at verse 9. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the, the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, how long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. Then each of them was given a white robe and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters were killed just as they had been. Okay. So these are the servants of God. All of them have to be killed. The full number has to be killed just as they had been. Then verse 12, I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red and the stars in the sky fell to the earth as figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. What do you think is happening right there? When the skies are falling or the stars are falling, and I'm thinking of Chicken Little. The stars are falling as uh, figs from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. Now listen to the next verse. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the princes and generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves among the rocks and the mountains. Okay, so... If the heavens have already receded, what has happened? That's the seventh trumpet. I'm going to show you that in Peter. But first, I just want to point out here 
that once that has happened, the kings of the earth. So once the trumpet has blown and these things have happened, the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of their wrath has come and who can withstand it? So that is proof right there. Once I substantiate with second Peter that that is the seventh trumpet, that is proof that the kings of the earth who are still in power because Babylon is still in power, they are still here and all of the wicked will rise and go to condemnation. Let's take a look at second Peter uh, chapter three, verse 10 uh, through 12. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day, that day, the day that he comes, will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. That day when he comes. So it's very clear when this is going to happen. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Now, part of the reason this is important is because people are apparently, some people are <laughs> apparently, I have learned tonight, arguing that the 45 days between the 1290th day and the 1335th day, that that's the great wrath of God. No, that's just the beginning of the great wrath of God. It's 45 days of the beginning of the great wrath of God. It is the hour of trial and testing that God is going to bring on the entire earth in order to test the inhabitants of the earth. Why is he doing that? Because, you know, a lot of people have not been willing to pick this up and be tested and be put through the fire. And so they're going to have to prove themselves because truly it's the last hour to prove themselves. So they're going to be put through it to see if they're truly going to believe in him. Are they truly going to believe that he's able to pass over them? Because I saw some people getting all weird about COVID. You know, if you're in him, then you know that he has the ability to pass over his people and that he doesn't bring diseases on his people if they're in him, if they're listening to him. But he will bring these things on you to bring you back in. But here's the thing. I never was afraid that I was going to die from COVID. I knew that if I got COVID, that God was dealing with me on something. And I've had it, I think, three times. And I'm pretty sure that every time I've had it, I've talked to you about it and told you exactly what he was bringing me in on. And it lasted like but a few days. There was one, one thing that I had after that whole situation with that contractor where I made a decision apart from God then he was really dealing with me and I dealt with it for seven days. But you know what? I didn't die. He's not ready for me. I mean, I'm not ready, really. I'm not ready yet. I'm fulfilling a covenant that I have with him here. And I am very aware that if he brings me in on something, he is dealing with me or he's bringing me in for a message. But I saw people like wearing goggles and doubling up on their masks and their, you know, gloves. That is not understanding. That is not understanding. That is without understanding about who is sovereign and what God has said about when he brings these things, that he will not put on you any of the diseases that he put on the Egyptians if you're following him. So if he puts something on you, he's calling you back. When I send these things, if my people who are called by my name will return to me, I will return to them. In any event, the reason I'm going down this road is because at that time, when these things are happening, when God's wrath is here, you're going to have to put your faith where your mouth is. You're going to have to stand. You're going to have to remind yourself that God passes over his people. You're going to have to remind yourself that if he's bringing any grief on you, that you better get it together and you better receive because it is the last hour. And I'm not talking about a God hour. I'm talking about it is the last hour, like our kind of hour. You'd better get it together. But truly, don't wait that long because you don't know how long he requires you to get it together. <laughs> so anyway, the thing that was being argued is that that's the entirety of God's wrath. Well, it's not. And we just proved it. We just proved it because otherwise the seals would have ended right there. But they don't. And we know that that is the trumpet. We know that that is the time when the trumpet blows 
That's what's going to happen. God's people go up, but the heavens will recede like a scroll, and the people are going to know that God's wrath has come. Hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? So Job was right. Scripture is true through and through from, a thousand, from thousands of years to thousands of years. Amazing. Let me read Second Peter one more time so that you're crystal clear about this. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. What is Peter talking about? The day of the Lord when he comes like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. That is what the wicked are going to be here to experience. Everyone is going to rise at that time. Everyone is going to rise. What that means is that they will rise from their tombs and their graves. They will see him, even those who pierced him. But the only ones going up are God's people and the wicked will remain. They will experience God's wrath. Now, one more thing that I want to mention regarding this false doctrine about you know, people saying that the that we're going to be here for his uh, for the entirety of his great wrath. We are going to be here for the first 45 days of his great wrath from the 1290th day to the 1335th day. One thing that was said is that the seven bowls of God's wrath or the vials as is uh, as it's described in, I think, King James Version, that they're the same as the trumpets. Absolutely not. Go ahead and study. Compare and contrast the trumpets and the vials or the bowls of wrath. Absolutely not the same thing. It's very clear in chapter 15 that God's people have already been victorious over the mark of the beast, its image, and the beast. If they've been victorious, then that's got to go along with all of scripture. And all of scripture states that you have to endure till the end, even unto death. And so if the end hasn't come, you've not been victorious yet. So it's clear that God's people are not here for those last plagues. And of course they're not because God repeatedly gives this warning to escape Babylon's judgment so that you won't bear in those plagues. Now, I mean, could God spare you from bearing those plagues and you continue to be here? Sure he could, but why? But why? He doesn't give more grief than is necessary. He doesn't give grief willingly. So why would he have you here for the entire judgment that he's going to bring on the wicked, that doesn't really make sense. That's like beyond testing. And as it is, we've already demonstrated it in scripture. You won't be here for the entire great wrath of God, only for the first 45 days. The other thing that I thought was kind of, you know, tried to be convincing, tried to be compelling is in chapter 16, as the word is talking about the bulls of wrath in verse 15, God gives a warning and he says, look, I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and remains clothed so as not to go naked and be shamefully exposed. And so some people interpret that to mean that after the uh, seventh bowl of wrath, well, why is he saying that after the seventh bowl of wrath? Well, look on the next page. He's giving a warning, just like in chapter 18, he talks about he the, the lament over fallen Babylon, and then he gives a warning here, a warning to escape Babylon's judgment. Can he do whatever he wants? Yeah, he can write this however he wants. I mean, he's describing something just like if I told you, you know, you know, I have this wall heater and it just gets so hot and I burned myself on the wall heater. Don't touch the wall heater. It's really hot. And then I start talking about my burn from the wall heater. I mean, can I break in my thought and tell you? So I'm telling you all this, I'm, I'm telling you all this story so that I can warn you about it. That's what he's doing there. He's telling you about the bulls of wrath and the horrible things that are going to happen to the wicked. And then he's warning you, look, I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and remains clothed so as not to go naked and be shamefully exposed. He's just simply giving you a warning. It doesn't have to be chronological. It doesn't have to fit with necessarily like the events of what he's talking about. And by the way, if he's warning you right there after the seventh bowl, it's a little late, isn't it? I mean, thanks, but no thanks. It's kind of late because I've already experienced this. Okay. So that argument does not stand either. And 
you know, it's wonderful that God has put an example on the very next page of what he's doing. He tells you, fallen, fallen is Babel on the great. He goes through this lament and then he says, so, I mean, essentially, he's saying, so come out of her, my people. Therefore, come out of her, my people. He's giving a warning. God is so good. I feel so much peace right now and so much clarity. And I'm so grateful. Anytime this happens, don't assume you're wrong. Don't let the get, devil get the best of you. I mean, I, you know, and I say that while knowing that I also was kind of shaken up because I didn't know about that verse in Job. And then, of course, I'm dealing with this person who's very pompous and haughty, extremely arrogant. So that's just, you know, contributing to the angst. But all in all, I stayed connected with God. I stepped away. He tested my heart and mind to make sure that I would say something. And that was part of the thing I was sorting through with him was, hey, if I'm wrong, I will say something. But then you know where I go is like, oh, if I'm wrong, I'm taking my books off the shelf. Then I can't, you know, do this. And I, I fasted and everyone else fasted with me before we published that book. I, I really went there. But it's just, I mean, honestly, it's just a testament to my heart for what it is that I'm doing. I do not want to present a stumbling block to anyone. My heart wants each and every one of you to be saved and to know the truth and to have a voice of truth and reason on God's word. So that was kind of a cool tidbit, wasn't it? I hope you enjoyed it and God bless you. I'll see you in the next video.